I suppose I should have had that gulp of water prior to starting the news. But anyway, that's okay. Today is Sunday, February 11th, 2024. Already? What? So, hello, Mirthlings, and I trust you're all well. We're going to start the news at home in Australia. Well, the land we dwell on. From Sydney Morning Herald, the headline. He's obviously unwell. Barnaby Joyce filmed lying on Canberra Street. Look, most of us are going, huh? Barnaby Joyce has been filmed lying all over Australia. I'm reading. Former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce says he was talking to his wife, Vicky Campion, before he fell off a planter box and was swearing because he hurt himself. After he was caught on video lying on his back on a footpath late at night, mumbling obscenities on his phone. Video obtained and first published by Daily Mail Australia. Look, I can't lie. I, as, as someone who likes to curate news, and this is exactly what we're doing here, curating news from around the world and sharing it in a way that is understandable or, you know, I don't know. I don't, I, sometimes I'm thinking, what am I reading here right now? But listen to this, okay? Daily Mail Australia, in amongst all its tabloid sleaze and all of that, actually has... Um, some news pieces. So you really, really have to dig hard and everywhere and you've got to go high and you've got to go low. So video obtained and first published by Daily Mail Australia showed Joyce on his back in Lonsdale Street, a popular Canberra restaurant street. I've been there after 11.30 p.m. on Wednesday, prompting several Nationals colleagues to ask why he wasn't helped to his feet. Look, I agree. How rude. How disrespectful. Come on, the man was our deputy prime minister. Why shouldn't a guy who says he is a strong Catholic with conservative values campaigning against same-sex marriage, etc., etc., but then, <laughs> Mr. Conservative Values, <sighs> turns out Mr. Barnaby took his joystick, wink, wink, <laughs> for regular rides leaving and then abandoning his wife and four daughters to take up with his former staff member who is a political journalist and that's the wife he was talking to when he fell off the planter box. I don't need to mention the age gap and that Joyce, Barnaby Joyce, is as sexy as his name. Ah, anyway, we'll add this link to the caption on STV if you're watching this there right now. So this is, this is an interesting article, Five Reasons Why Barnaby Joyce is a Terrible, Horrible, No Good Choice for the Nation. Sorry, the, the actual headline says nationals, and that's the, uh, the uh, party he, is, he was the head of. Now, this article is written by Jenna Price. She is a columnist, an academic, and anti-genocide, pro-humanity, person of Jewish faith. And again, as I said, we'll link that article. But that article is from 21, 2021. Now, this one is from a few days ago. Cyclone Barnaby's wall on renewables could put the wind up the libs. Headlines, eh? This is from Sydney Morning Herald, written by David Crow. The crowd, 400 strong, outside Parliament House gave Barnaby Joyce a hero's welcome on Wednesday morning when the former Nationals leader told them to build a movement, told them, sorry, to build a movement that could topple the Labour government. 400. Okay. You know, oh well. What he did not tell them, though, was that they might only trouble the Liberals. You're not coming, you're coming out, you're going to change our nation. I don't have a good accent that way. Uh, in terms of what Joyce is saying, Joyce hollered from a makeshift podium on the lawn. Their cause? To stop every wind and solar power project in regional Australia. Hmm, Mr. Joyce, there is a reason no one wants to help you off the footpath. So, anyway, it really must be time for One Take News. So, we're still in Australia, and now we're saying Peter Dutton commits to repealing right to disconnect laws if coalition wins the government. And this is by political reporter Jake Evans for ABC. I'm reading, Opposition leader, Liberal, Peter Dutton has sworn to repeal laws that will give workers the right to ignore unreasonable out-of-hours communications from their bosses if the coalition wins the next federal election. The government agreed to include a right to disconnect in its industrial relations bill, which was rushed through the Senate last week in a last-minute deal with the Greens and the crossbench. 
Ignoring suggestions. Sorry, I just needed to uh, just see if I've got lipstick on my teeth because ugh, seriously, this is what this is, feels like. Ignoring suggestions. Let me start that again. Ignoring suggestions, it should be referred to committee for closer scrutiny or that those amendments should have been circulated publicly. The government has since realized the bill included a mistake that could see bosses face criminal prosecution for contacting employees out of hours. Now, I had saved the original story early in the week, but this is a, this is why it's it's hard to curate a weekly story because things change so rapidly and facts or propaganda and public relations comes into the fore. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, it'll be corrected in Parliament at next sitting, apparently. We're freelancers, my uh, husband and I, Dwayne and I, so we're used to working all hours. But I still draw the line at being cold called at night and without my consent. Like, I prefer a text. You know, send me a text and I may say yes. <laughs> you know, the way I feel about it, being a freelance creative is you owe me money. Your money doesn't mean you owe me. That's it. It's just a work transaction. But uh, I do understand, and I, I find it really shocking that they're um, in the, the workplace now, your bosses and your nine to five job was well, no longer nine to five, right? But apparently your, your, your higher management can call you at any time of the day and night and on weekends. And look, I just think that that's kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why aren't they unplugging? What, what is this rush? to, you know, make profits and squeeze the last dollar out of everyone so that there can be more billionaires in the world. Look, I don't know. I, it's, it's, look, it's imperative for us to unplug. Yeah, yeah, Vinaka Morpheus. Anyway, <laughs> I'm reading. You won't get that unless you're from Fiji. Um, Mr. Dutton says, even corrected, the laws will be damaging to relations between employers and employees and make the task of restarting productivity growth even more difficult. What? So for an employee to have a discon you know, to be able to have a boundary with their employer to say that, uh, yeah, look, you know, this is work, not it's it's part of life, not my life. This is what I don't get. Well, I do get. But why don't the, why doesn't everybody else? It, there's no such thing as as work and life balance. There is only life. Hello, life, and work is a part of it. Work is what you know gives us. <laughs> I'm reading. Asked on Sky News, a conservative but see, you know, nevertheless vulgar news channel, if his party would repeal the right to disconnect. If it won government, Mr. Dutton responded with an emphatic, yes, we will. Look, at this stage, anyone could uh, start a party like Senator David Pocock, who is independent. He's started his own political party of one. You know what? Hmm. So this is what Mr. Dutton says. If you think it's okay to outsource your industrial relations or your economic policy to the Greens, which is what the Prime Minister is doing, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, then we are going to see a continuation of the productivity problem in our country. Wow. So let me just tell you about the Greens, right? The Greens want a better life for us all. It's, it's, look, it's, uh, the, <laughs> it's just, it's such a pity they're seen as, look, uh, as I have already mentioned uh, a Fiji word, so I might as well mention another one. There's a term, a term, a word in Fiji, Malai. Ah, and that's what the Greens are seen as. Uh, just look, look, they're all very lovely. And the leader, Adam Bant, is, is good. He's compassionate. He's kind. He, he's transparent. And Senator, you know, Maureen Faruqi is, look, she's, she's got country power. And, um, yeah, but look, the rest are a bit, um, they're lovely. They're, they're nice. They're nice. By the way, this is entirely coincidental. This is the Lunar Year Wood Dragon homage from, from me and Outtake News, uh, Outtake News, One Take News, that's what it is. And the dragon is green for the wood dragon. So this is how the greens should be, full of fire. But anyway, I'm reading. And as the Reserve Bank governor pointed out, this is what Dutton is saying, if you don't address it, you'll see interest rates continue to climb or you'll see them stay higher for longer. Bullshit. 
What a rubbish. So it's all just profit, profit, profit. And that's what it's all about. So these people are clearly saying, look, the bottom line is not your life. It's the bottom line. It's their profit. It's their life. Yeah. So let me summarize this for you. You will never, ever stop being a slave to the system is what he's saying. Oh, and also the system which, you know, parliamentarians investment properties. The next story from Sydney Morning Herald. Independent ACT senator, speaking of David Pocock, has questioned whether the high level of multiple property ownership among federal politicians has skewed the parliament's ability to have a sensible discussion about tax concessions. <laughs> More than 65% of all federal parliamentarians own two or more properties, drawing a stark contrast with the lived experience of millions of voters who rent. You know, the people who actually voted these people into, you know, the people's representatives in the people's voice, a.k.a. the government. I'm reading, it's hard to believe this doesn't skew the perspective of parliamentarians when considering the suitability of generous tax concessions, the independent senator said. Pocock owns a home in the ACT and has disclosed another property interstate for which he has lent friends money for their deposit and is on the title. His friends pay the mortgage and Pocock does not derive income from the property. I should say that David Pocock is a former Wallabies captain like the highest tier of rugby union in Australia. Um, too bad the AR useless has made the Wallabies. We're moving on. Other news headlines from ABC, just from ABC. Did Scott Morrison have a problem with women? Kegs keep being stolen from pubs and breweries. It, it is costing the industry dearly. <laughs> anyway, let's go to the Fiji Times. Uh, here it says, Weather Watch. Unsettled weather may continue to affect Fiji over the next few days, but is unlikely to develop into a tropical cyclone due to an unfavorable environment. Look, I don't really understand this. So it's not going to develop into the devastating cyclone because the environment isn't favorable. So, that, you know, favorable to me has positive, uh, anyway, speaking of unfavorable environments, the rest of the stories on the Fiji Times, it's just, it's, it's, it seems to be about all the drug problems in Fiji, and you're probably thinking drug problems in Fiji. Oh, yes. Paradise is a paradox. So, some of the headlines are, drugs are dangerous. People need to realize. I'm reading. Drugs are dangerous, and this is from the Fiji Times, and we need to make people realize this is a serious issue, says Fiji College of General Practitioners President, Dr. Rajesh Maharaj. The college spearheaded an open dialogue event in collaboration with the Fiji Council of Churches, aimed at fostering cooperation with various religious organizations to raise awareness about the perils of drug abuse. The next headline is, and the next news story is from Fiji Times still, Rise in Ice, a Dangerous Trend. Lautoka Sikh Temple President Bayant Singh says the rise in the use of meth in the country has become a dangerous trend. It actually says meth methamphetamine, but I am cold reading all of these news stories. So while speaking to the Fiji Times yesterday, Mr. Singh said international cooperation on monitoring and investigation of the trafficking of meth needed to be strengthened. Drugs is becoming a dangerous precedent for our youth. Youths are the future. Sorry, look, I ha this is I'm quoting, I'm reading. So youths is what I am reading because that is still the way that is uh, written and said in Fiji. And yes, English is the official language of Fiji, but youths are part of their vernacular and vocabulary. And I am reading. So um, let me just start that again because, just in case, you know, drugs are becoming a dangerous precedent for our youth. Youth is the future of this country, and we want the youth to be thinking of a brighter future for Fiji and themselves. Really, I just need to have time out here. Fiji Times, the standard here really needs to go up. And I don't, I'm not saying this, we must keep up with our colonial master's language, which 
P P S A here. I must re- you know must remind you that English is a lingua franca and it is taken from the gl- the world, so it's more a global language. And if you really really go- are going to push it, it's actually a Germanic language, Anglo-Saxon, which you know those were uh, Germanic vill- German villages, the um, the colonizers of actual British Isles. But anyway, and but my point here is, we went through all that colonization. We're supposed to be better than the colonizers. So, Fiji Times, you really need to brush this stuff up. And hey, I'm willing to give you my services to come in and train your writers in the art of writing of all genres and news and editorials, etc., etc. Because this is really, really not good. I was trained in Fiji at a time when our standards were right up there, and this is not good enough. Not good enough at all. Fiji Times, what a disappointment. Anyway. I'm going to keep reading because also these stories, uh, perhaps uh, the subscriber editions uh, stories have got more in depth. They still say youth, but they perhaps have more in depth because I'm not seeing any critical thinking here in any of these articles. And this is not the journalist's fault. It is the editor's fault. So reading here, um, this is we're still to- quoting the uh, Sikh temple president, Mr. Singh. And he said the judiciary should dish out deterrent sentences to those involved in getting the hard drugs into the country. I, I agree. So another article, uh, same, in, uh, do, you know, on the Fiji Times right now, youths again turn to marijuana. Um, more, again in the story, more youth are planting marijuana than traditional root crops. And uh, this is according to a source, which they name. They actually name their source in the story. Which I guess if the, if the source is willing to be named, great. But it's not very investigative journalism on this, on, uh, in this regard. But uh, look, let me remind you, as I said just earlier, I was trained in Fiji in journalism on radio and television. I started my career in media on radio and then I was one of the first television news readers of Fiji's, um, Fiji television, not with Fiji One but with the Fiji National Video Center and that was back in 1990, oh gosh, two, yes, okay, so I'm continuing this. You should protect your sources always. Most youth facing financial challenges turn to marijuana because it was easier to cultivate and faster to harvest. The source says it is easy money. And that's the problem. And all these stories I've written about the drug. Uh, I've, I haven't written that. I should have rewritten them, actually. Uh, but that I have read out about. It's always blaming the youth. Always blaming them. Let me read this further. Meanwhile, Minister for Youth and Sports, Chese Saokuru, is urging youth to be pillars of change. Uh-uh, mate. They're youth. Wow. Talk about passing the buck. Talk about a lack of accountability. The Minister for Youth is supposed to be a role model in helping youth aspire to be better and not actually then saying, here, the responsibility for your... (laughs) So he says, rather than planting marijuana, you youths should take the lead in creating change in your community. He said, you will be the leaders one day. Wow. Wow. No, 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 no. And I, I'm not, I shouldn't make fun of the youths because as I said, this is Fiji vernacular and people should be allowed to speak this language any which way they want, any which way they want because this language was stolen from all over the world. But anyway, my point with this is he is saying to the young people, yeah, you, you stuff you. We don't have to be responsible for role modeling anything. Uh, you can just, oh my gosh, that fend for yourself is basically what Young people in Fiji are told, fend for yourself. So the other thing is, so there's a lot of, uh, the story had also cited that there's a lot of raids being done by the police force right now. But uh, the Fiji Times, okay, this is the one thing they do. I'm not, I'm not absolutely, understand this. I am not at all um, negating the talents of people in Fiji. But what I am questioning is why the people of Fiji are not being given the right to better their natural skills. Why aren't the people on top? Ooh, this is an interesting thing. Why aren't, the, why are the people on, on top still doing this thing of just, you know, uh, uh, creating obstacles for young people? 
Why are older people in Fiji creating obstacles for younger people? Is my question. Anyway, so back to the article. Questions about the farm raids sent to the Fiji police force remain unanswered when this edition went to press. And what I was saying about the youth being uh, really oppressed still. Uh, now it's uh, the colonization is coming from older generations. It's crazy. So um, what I'm saying is that I have met many, many good journalists in Fiji who want to push for the truth. They really do. I can I can uh, tell you many, uh, well, not many, but a few names, and there are a few names that I would love to give chances to, it, and and really, really critically thinking about um, the journalism that they need to do and ans asking questions because this is what what is what is going on here? Why is everyone just blaming the young people for the problems that have existed way way before these young people were even born? So these young people have been born into a time where there is no hope. No jobs, nothing to look forward to, and the old people are still sitting their asses, their fat asses, mind you. The elite, <laughs> these big fish in the small pond became fat fish in a very murky pond. It's a cesspool now. No wonder everyone's turning to drugs. But you know what? They could turn all this stuff around because life <laughs> in the last few years has, years has told us that, well, nothing, nothing is actually carved in stone because a threat of a mere virus shut borders down like this. And for countries that depend on tourism as their, you know, main income and all of that, well, I'll tell you, whew, Fiji really, really suffered. So it's time to rethink and time to think outside of this, you know, colonization box. And, the, and you're still being colonized, people in Fiji. The expatriates are still selling our land. Well, it's not my land. It's not anyone else's except the Kaiviti. But all of us who were born there, we belong nowhere else. All right. So we are tied to the land in some way or the other. And I, for one, want to always, always see that land and its people go from better to best to better and best always. And I will continue to take a stand for this because there are far too many people in positions of, I don't know, it's not leadership, <laughs> but it's, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on, right? But as I was saying, um, so about, about tourism, if, if, if cannabis is such a huge problem and it's so easy to grow there, why not make it an industry? Why not actually give this youth, youths, these youth, something modern? If, as the Fiji Times master said, I don't know if it still says it, but it used to it that, uh, way before, the first newspaper published in the world today because, hey, the international dateline, you know, runs right through Fiji, but not on the map. But if we are one of the first, and we are the first, certainly the first sophisticated country, yeah, fight me. <laughs> We're certainly the first, the sophisticated, first sophisticated country to see the, the, the day, right? So why can't we lead the way? <sighs> Why can't Fiji think outside of its colonization, colonized in every single way? You know what? Uh, I really believe, though, that there are people there who are talking about such things like medical cannabis, uh, cannabis tourism. Now, that would create a different kind of tourism. That would be a travelism, a culturalism, a discovery, because... If, if cannabis is now attached to the word medical and legal, well, I'm sorry. The, now we're all of a sudden going, oh, yeah, actually it turns out to be, a, a, you know, uh, a medicinal marvel and a magical miracle um, gift from the earth. Utilize it then and stop blaming young people. Oh, my goodness me. Wow. Seriously, I really need. I can, anyway, we're moving on. <clears throat> Let's go to the state of America <laughs> from Jezebel and Jezebel is like I, I get my news I curate news from a lot of different sites I'm sometimes 60 75 depending on what I'm reading because I read all sorts of uh, news sources Jezebel is a favorite one it's loaded with sarcasm and I love it it's one of my favorite sites you, you do have to be careful where you get your news from get it get it from here one take news <laughs> and because I curate news very soon, uh, our magazine, The Stylander, is going to be, uh, provi be providing the news. Stick with us and, um, you know, get the news from, from transparency. So, from Jezebel. <laughs> oh, boy, the state of America, eh? So, 
Missouri rejects rape exceptions. Senator says forced birth can be the greatest healing agent. That is the headline. <laughs> oh my goodness. In 2022, Missouri was the first state to ban abortion when Roe v. Wade was overturned, and anti-abortion lawmakers in the state are continuing their streak of cruelty. On Wednesday, across party lines, Republicans rejected an amendment that would have added rape and incest exceptions to the state's total ban. Do you, do you understand what, what that means? So here, I'll continue reading. Democratic State Senator Tracy McCreary said the ban tells victims, we're going to force you to give birth, even if that pregnancy resulted from forcible rape by a family member, a date, an ex-husband or a stranger. This is the land of the free, folks. This is, ah, oh, America. The land of dreams. Except if you're a woman. Except if you're a non-Euro-white male. Or you are a, an Oreo. Or a Euro-white template person there. Um, wow. Anyway. So. So. I'm reading. As if voting to reject McCreary's amendment weren't insulting enough to victims. Whew. State Senator Rick Bratton, ex Republican, <laughs> explained his vote against it by arguing that being forced to carry their rapist's baby could be healing for victims. This is Senator Rick Bratton, B R A T T I N saying that carrying your rapist's baby could be healing for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm reading. If you want to go after the rapist, let's give him the death penalty, Bratton said. But not the innocent person. Person! Caught in between. In between! That by God's grace, grace, may even be the greatest healing. Oh my God, I am getting even more traumatized by this shit healing agent you need in which to recover from such an atrocity. And Jezebel continued, the writer Kylie Chu continues to write, seemingly trying to make his comments as horrific as possible, Bratton also managed to compare abortion to slavery. Meanwhile, Republican Senator Bill Igel, who's running for governor in Missouri, inexplicably claimed Senator Tracy McCreary's proposed amendment would bring back the institution of abortion so that kids can get abortions in the state of Missouri, stating a one-year-old could get an abortion under this. To this, a Democratic senator returned, I don't know that a one-year-old could get pregnant, Senator. This is America, folks. You, If you're watching uh, on our uh, channel, STV, then all the links to these stories are in the caption. And of course, if you're watching this on Stylander, on the Stylander, well, they're all there too. So globally from Vice News, this is very intriguing. And the link to the footage is in, again, the caption. So Vice News, and I don't really know what's happening with Vice News now, but Vice News interviewed Ensia Kazali, Iran's vice president, my apologies, for women and family affairs. She is the vice president for women and family affairs. And so they interviewed her after gaining exclusive access inside the country since Mahsa Amini's death in September 2022. You've got to watch this. It is very, very scary. The Vice News journalist and her team, they were, they got into a bit of trouble. So watch, uh, watch that footage, please. Wow. So now we're going to Al Jazeera. Pakistan's Khan and Sharif both claim election win despite no clear majority. Protests erupted across the country over delays as final results of Thursday's elections have not yet been released. Pakistan faces a period of uncertainty with the election results showing no clear majority and two opposing political leaders, Nawaz Sharif from Pakistan Muslim League and Imran Khan from Pakistan Tariq e Insaf declaring victory. So that's both of them declaring victory. Independent candidates, mostly linked to jailed leader Khan's PTI, are well ahead with 102 seats. Now, 
we need a back some backstory here. So this is also from Al Jazeera. So why has Imran Khan been jailed? He is very, very popular. The people love him. Um, so Pakistan XPM Imran Khan and wife sentenced to 14 years in jail, of course. Well, Khan was handed a three-year prison sentence in August in a case brought by the Election Commission of Pakistan for not disclosing assets based on the sale of state gifts worth more than 140 million rupees, which is um, US $501,000. He received when he was the Prime Minister from 2018 to April 22. So these are the gifts he sold, which uh, gifts he received. And look, I don't know. I mean... I, Am I, am I, is something wrong with, am I, have I got some sort of weird thing wrong? Was it given to him personally or was it given to the state? Anyway, um, the sense, the sentencing in that case was suspended. The latest sentencing pertains to a parallel case brought by an anti-corruption agency in which Khan and his wife are accused of graft in the sale of state gifts. The convictions against arguably Pakistan's most popular politician came about a week before the general elections on February 8th. <laughs> do, 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 do. Patterns. Dot, 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 dot. Connect them. Khan's Pakistan Tariq en Saf has already been stripped of its election symbol, the cricket bat. And if you don't know why it's the cricket bat, you really don't know much news, do you? Please do go find out. Um, so, and with all of its candidates, so it's stripped of its, you know, uh, the election symbol, the cricket bat, and with all of its candidates contesting as independents. So, back to the previous story. According to Al Jazeera's Abid Hussein, two days after the polls have closed, a split mandate has emerged among the big three political powers, and there is little clarity about what comes next. With such a split, the big question now rests on who will be able to form a government in Pakistan, a country of 240 million people, which has suffered a turbulent two years with political instability, an economy on the verge of default and rising internal security challenges. Boy. So we're going to Reuters now. Uh, this would have been this story was about eight, eight hours ago. Russia closes presidential race candidate registration with Putin and three others. Russia's registration of candidates for the March presidential election has closed, TASS reported on Sunday, with a list including President Vladimir Putin, who is expected to win, and three politicians who all support Moscow's war in Ukraine. The list did not include the Russian anti-war candidate Boris Nadezhdin, after the Central Election Commission barred him on Thursday from running, saying it had found flaws in the collection of signatures required for the support of his candidacy. How funny. A, a politician who is there for the people and an, a, a, and another politician who is anti-war all of a sudden have been found f with, with uh, guilty or flawed? Anyway, I'm going back to the story I'm reading. Putin, 71, <laughs> who has chosen to run as an independent rather than as the candidate of the ruling United Russia Party, and who has been Russia's paramount leader since 2000 and controls all the state's levers, is expected to easily win next month's vote. I'm reading. While nobody has expected the 60-year-old Nadezhdin who has characterized Putin's war in Ukraine as a fatal mistake. So while no one has expected him to win, his transient criticism has surprised some analysts. And by that, he's unbridled, like he's just, he's sick and tired, but he's just saying it. And that's what we need. People who are unafraid and transparency. Younger people, 
who are at a nice level. So, you know, 53-year-old women and 60-year-old Russian anti-war candidates <laughs> and political candidates. So this is what they, this, I'm reading. The Kremlin has said it does not see him as a serious rival to Putin. Well, uh, let me reread if it says there that Putin, who controls all the states, everything, is expected to easily win the next month's vote. So of course, Nadezhdin is not a threat. <laughs> My God. The war, which the Kremlin called a special military operation, is nearing the end of its second year. It has killed thousands on both sides, displaced millions of Ukrainians, and turned scores of cities and villages into rubble. Sorry, sorry, rubble. Moving on. Also from Reuters, and this is about now an hour and a half ago. Russia launches drone attacks on Kiev, southern Ukraine says Ukraine's military. This was about an hour and a half ago, updated on Al Jazeera, I'm sorry, Reuters. And it says, the, um, the priority for the enemy was again the coastal strip of infrastructure and agro-industrial facilities, the Ukrainian military said. Again, all links to all of these stories and headlines are in the caption. Speaking of coastal strips, like, you know, if you look at things in just very uh, objectively, not very objectively, just objectively, which is a very difficult thing to do because most times most of us are looking at things subjectively because it is how we form an opinion is through how we feel about something. So having an objective opinion is, look, that's an oxymoron. I think you can have an objective, I feel and I believe and I know you can have an objective observation. So when you step back and have objective observations things become very, very clear. So speaking of coastal strips from Wired, Hulu, which is a channel, a, a cable or whatever streaming channel in the state of America, shows jarring anti-Hamas ad likely generated with AI. The ad, which appears to be made using generative AI, shows how the technology can be used not just to mislead, but to more subtly influence. This 30 second spot opening like a tourism ad shows palm trees and coastlines. There are five star hotels and children playing. People dance, eat and laugh while a voiceover encourages visitors to experience a culture rich in tradition. But it suddenly shifts, turning the face of a smiling man into a grimacing one. This is what Gaza could have been like without Hamas, the narrator says. A new series of images flashes, this time of fighters and weapons and children wandering the streets or holding guns. Oh my God. The ad flattens decades of conflict between Israel and Palestinians and centuries of war in the region into a 30 second ad that appears to use AI to help spread its propaganda. The reality of who is responsible, I must say that propaganda is the word I have put in place of the word that um, Wired chooses to use and that was message because they're being impartial. The reality of who is responsible for the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza is a far more complicated issue than portrayed in the short ad. Again, that is wired I'm reading from. I'm going to continue reading. Hamas, which has been deemed a terrorist organization by the United States, Canada, Britain, Japan, and the European Union, what do they all have in common? seized control of the Gaza Strip in 2007. So Hamas, deemed a terrorist organization, seized control of the Gaza Strip in 2007. And let me tell you again who they were deemed a terrorist organization by the United States, Canada, Britain, Japan, and the European Union. Israeli troops and settlers occupied Gaza from the 1967 war until 2005 when Israel's military and citizens withdrew from the Palestinian territory. The United Nations and several other international entities still consider Gaza to be effectively occupied, although the US and Israel dispute that label. Wow, no one saw that one coming. I'm reading, as of last week, more than 25,000 people have been killed in Gaza since October 7th. According to Gaza's health ministry, the UN estimates that 1.9 million people in Gaza, approximately 85% of the population, 
have been displaced. Around 1,200 Israelis were killed by Hamas in the October 7th attack that led to the current crisis. This ad appears to contain some imagery made using generative AI. And activists have used generative AI throughout the conflict to garner support for each side. I'm still reading. This ad isn't really a deep fake, but it does show how the rapid advances in generative AI can be used to create lifelike and emotional propaganda. Even if people know something isn't real, the content can still influence them. Look, frankly, people are so overloaded with information now that they will believe or deny without any critical thinking in between. Like deep fakes. You know, people just, 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 I can't, I don't know. Uh, anyway, speaking of deep fakes from BBC, Trump says he would encourage Russia to attack NATO allies who don't pay their bills. Oh my gosh. Donald Trump says he would encourage Russia to attack any NATO member that fails to pay its bills as part of the Western military alliance. He said he, won he had once told a NATO leader he would not protect a nation behind on its payments if it came under attack from Russia and would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. Members of NATO commit to defend any nation in the bloc that gets attacked. Now, I can't quite remember what NATO stands for, so let me just take quickly look at I can't. I shouldn't be admitting that as a news journalist, should I? But um, it's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and that's why I don't remember it, because in my mind, I just see it. Oh, you mean the, 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 the white people? Okay. Anyway, going back to the news, the Europeans. But still, still, they're, you know, they're, 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 they're not all... Hello. They're not all bad, okay? Look, if they're they're saying they're and look, this is look look, they're not all bad because the White House called the comments appalling and unhinged. Mate, for the White House to say that. Wow. Anyway, okay, from the from deep fake to shallow fake. <laughs> I shouldn't say shit like that. Whoops. Beep. The Swift Bowl is taking place this weekend in Super America. Have I got that wrong? Maybe. But the Super Bowl, Super Bowl, World Series. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really, it's all about Taylor Swift now. Look, Taylor Swift is that person of the moment. Uh, what have I got to tell you about Taylor Swift? I did say shallow fake. Look, I cannot deny this. Uh, the, the young woman is very, well, she's 33, young, is talented, super talented, super skilled at what she does. But... You know, she's, she's become a billionaire on, on the back of everyone's heartbreak. What is this saying about the Euro white world? Yo, girls, what's happening to you? Why are you allowing your Euro white males to do this to you? To break your hearts? To make a young woman who's had the most miserable love life, you know, apparently. Because, well, it seems that she just, you know, um, I think perhaps that she's not actually living the life that she is meant to because, you know, it might spoil her appeal to the people she needs to appeal to. But, well, look, tune in next time or to one of my workshops and I'm going to be giving a public relations workshop soon and I will explain to you the power of public relations and how public relations rules the world. I mean... Super Bowl and World Series, what, 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 what? But let, look, we're talking about Super Bowl. You know what the best thing about Super Bowl is, apart from sometimes the halftime? Really, that's the best thing about the Super Bowl, right? Look, I get it. We all love our sports and all these huge things. In, in, for rugby union um, lovers in the you know, Southern Hemisphere, we love the Bled is Low Cup. Well, we used to love the Bled is Low Cup back when, you know, the AR Useless used to have a trophy cabinet full of trophies. Now they just got dust and spiderwebs. Anyway, look, Super Bowl ads, right? They're a really big deal. Super Bowl ads are like really, really good. And it makes you think that the state of America is very, very clever. And, but they re really use some silly, like, well, look, the Beckhams recreate a supposedly cute thing they did in some cute thing they did. And Jen Aniston still gets paid very highly just to play Rachel Green in every single thing. Anyway, from the Hill, I'm reading. 
Advertising spending during this Sunday's Super Bowl is at near record levels, with the world's biggest companies shelling out large sums to get their products in front of millions of viewers. The average cost of a 30-second commercial for the NFL's biggest game of the year is around 7 million US dollars, the New York Times reported, noting a decade ago the average for the same amount of time was 4 million dollars. So, um, well, look, that's not that bad, right? And just an inflation of $3 million for a 30-second ad. Most ads last year sold for between $6 million and $7 million. Wow. For what? For what? Ads for what? To create more consumerism, whilst also selling it as transpa- Oh, no, 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 no. Authenticity! Because the Beckhams are so authentic that they're recreating that authentic moment they did in their highly edited, scripted, post-processed, authentic documentary. This is the world, folks. You know, this is why, like, Dwayne and I, when we can, we're totally going back to our home. Oops, look, I don't really want to talk about that. But right now, let's go see if there's space for us out there. Boom. boom. <laughs> oh, by the way. A peaceful and prosperous lunar year to everyone. And look, there's a reason uh, in, in the lunar calendar, it's actually considered late this year. And I'm reading from Earth Sky News. Why is the 2024 Lunar New Year so late? Look, I didn't actually know that until I read the news. I didn't realize it was late. I just assumed like a lot of all other, um, you know, cultural um, date uh, festivities and celebrations, etc. It's all based around practical things like harvest moons etc or when the moon comes to its full you know sight so i'm reading and unlike say the uh, the um, western world or the euro white world where everything is fixed they're fixed dates although easter moves around too which is very interesting easter is actually all about the harvest moon Anyway, well, I'm reading from Earth Sky News. Billions of people celebrate the Lunar New Year and have to keep up with its shifting date. In 2024, the Lunar Year starts 19 days later than in 2023, and that start that was yesterday, February 10th, 2024. So the New Year in East Asia and for many Asian communities around the world, as I just said, began on February 10th. Known as Spring Festival in China, Tet in Vietnam, and Siolol. In my apologies for not pronou- if I didn't pronounce that correctly. So that's in Korea. The Lunar New Year celebration marks the first new moon in the Chinese lunisolar calendar, a system that integrates lunar phases and solar years. So I'm just going to just give you some back info here. In China, uh, the the normal, you know, the normal, the the, the Eurostream. Gregorian calendar is used for everyday life. So their their days are the same days that everyone uses. But like for instance in Hinduism and I think most of India's regional um uh gosh people pro- uh, you know North Indian South Indian they have their own time especially South India considering their their language is one of the oldest languages in the world. And um, their their things, you know, their time, their their history is also much. Uh, hello, my darling. Thank you very much. I get tea. Um, so so it's used, but so yeah. But we all go by the Gregorian calendar. Chinese calendar dates continue to mark traditional holidays and to determine favorable dates like when to get married, etc., etc. I think you know those things, as is uh, in Hindu uh, Vedic astrology. So the Chinese calendar is a really, it's very complex, like everything, everything Chinese is very Asian origin countries and they're, you know, just the layers of um, of science and spirituality. But so the Chinese calendar is, as I said, a complex measure of time. And it's uh, a combination, as I said, it's called lunisolar, a combination of lunar phases and the solar um, years. Yeah, and let's not forget, this year is a leap year. So maybe there's a whole other lot of factors and like when, you know, it's it's a very scientific method of determining when that date is. It's it's, it's beautiful. Um, and also, the Chinese calendar has a long history. I'm reading now, spanning several Chinese dynastic periods from as far back as the Shang Dynasty around the 14th century BCE. 
again, uh, Gregorian calendar time also. Also, there are several different symbolic cycles within the calendar used in Chinese astrology. And this year is the year of the wood dragon the green wood dragon oh yeah <laughs> so from earth sky now we're talking astronomical news today's top news x flare this most powerful category of solar flare peaked at 1 14 pm uh yesterday and i think that would be uh this time well you know universal time whatever so the x 3.4 flare came from and you don't really need to know this, do you? But I'll say it anyway. AR3575. You know, scientists have really, really, like, just really clinical names for things. And then they go a little bit uh, too romantic with other names. And it's like, come on. Um, so the flare came from AR3575, which recently rotated out, ro rotated out of view over the sun's southwest limb, the edge. So... Did you know that the sun the sun rotates? Okay. Given its location, the sunspot region was partially occulted. That's their scientific term, occult. Occult, meaning blocked. So that's why um, anything esoteric is then dubbed occult because they say it's blocked. And I'm like, blocked from what? Anyway, anyway, reading. That means the X flare was larger than X3.4. So that's the uh, measurement of how to, you know, of how big it was. And it was actually larger, but because it was rotating at the time, they couldn't actually quite measure because, you know, we're out there with our cameras looking at the sun. Hey, what are they doing up there? Jokes. Come on. It is, it is quite far away. Okay. And you can't really look at the sun through your own camera, but these people, well, they can look at these things. So. The X flare, which is the strongest flare, produced a strong, fast coronal mass ejection, or CME, now measured at over 2,000 kilometers per second, or 7.2 million kilometers per hour, about 4.3 million miles per hour, just in case you're working in those uh, metric, uh, in, the, in those uh, measuring systems. Now, so because of the flare's position on the sun's outer edge, the limb, however, so uh, any sun stuff released by the CME is likely not headed towards Earth. That's what they think, because I think there's a dragon headed our way. Hope you are well this Sunday, February 11th, 2024. This was One Take News, episode two of season two, and a very prosperous, peaceful, blissful lunar New Year to you. Let's really send some good dragon, positive dragon vibes out there. Let's breathe fire with love. Thank you. Bye.